human likeness almost certainly doesn't cause a creepy response. The idea that this is a stepping stone to this is a stepping stone to this in terms of human likeness and then trying to understand why human likeness has this strange effect on our emotional reaction is kind of like the idea that this is a stepping stone to this is a stepping stone to this in terms of hair color and then trying to understand why hair color has such a strange effect on beauty. There's more than one thing changing between these images, and there are a bunch of cherry-picked examples. So why do we think there's anything going on at all? Pew, it's a logo. If you're unfamiliar with this model, they say with human recreations like androids or animations, when you move from abstract human to realistic human, when you increase the human likeness, there's a point when it's close to looking like a human, but not quite there, where it tends to get creepy. The common explanation is that our attention is subconsciously drawn to all the subtle ways that it's off. All the mistakes and differences become glaringly obvious, and it creeps us out. We are constantly looking for social connections. These sort of look like they should give that, but they don't. So we get a creepy sort of cognitive dissonance. It's eerie, creepy, or uncanny. Whereas here, it's so different that it's fine. We don't expect a social connection, so any human traits that are present are just sort of icing on the abstracted cake. And this is the idea of the uncanny valley. Isn't it weird that there's a gap? Boop, 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 boop. The lesson many people take from this is that you should aim for this level of likeness or this level of likeness. But never this level of likeness, because the human brain cannot take it. And lots of people have made up these examples of the phenomena. Now there is something going on, but these graphs and the explanations are kind of silly. Two things. First, saying it's eerie because it's so close to resembling a human that our attention is drawn to the differences is like saying a pizza topped with red paint instead of tomato sauce tastes off because it's so close to resembling a pizza that our attention is drawn to the differences. Does it taste off because it's almost like a pizza? Or is it the paint? Do these robots look creepy because they almost look like a human? Or are they creepy because they look like creepy humans? People who look distressed or diseased? People who are artificially expressive? People who have had a flesh mask loosely slapped onto their skull? People who look like their brains are broken and are about to start some shit. Is creepiness really about likeness? Can't anything be made to be creepy? Or at least creepier? Is it always because the likeness is so close? I mean, with an actual human, we probably wouldn't say they're creepy because the likeness is so close. And we would probably be more descriptive because the idea of human likeness, it doesn't really explain a whole lot. Yes, having human elements is a necessary condition for having creepy human elements. You can't look like a creepy human if you don't also look like a human. But fear, trust, and uncanniness are emotional responses. So we should be looking for the specific emotional triggers. Some changes can make them creepier. Others, not so much. Okay, but what if we just do random changes? Randomly changing features is kind of like when roboticists or artists aiming for perfect human likeness get the likeness wrong. The changes can make them stranger. And if we keep making random changes, it starts getting to a point where it no longer even resembles a human. Therefore, no longer resembles a creepy human. Therefore, uncanny valley. If this was the claim of the uncanny valley, it's probably sensible enough. But this is not the claim of the uncanny valley. The claim of the uncanny valley is randomly change features like when roboticists and artists get the likeness wrong. It can make them strange. But then morph that into a highly refined caricature or cartoon. Then add some other examples. Then ponder the mysteriousness of cognition. Which brings us to the second thing. These are cherry picked examples. Why don't we do something like this? Or this? You can do anything with cherry-picked examples. 
So with hair color's effect on beauty, for example, we would probably want to do something more like this. Change only one thing so you can isolate it from other factors. And then get a bunch of people to rank the images because beauty is subjective. But over here, likeness might be too broad to do anything like that, except maybe with random changes. But then you don't get the transition from abstraction to realism that the uncanny valley seems to be all about. But some researchers have tried. They took two images that could be on so-called peaks of a so-called uncanny valley, and they morphed them together. They got a bunch of subjects to rank the images, both in terms of human likeness and eeriness, because both eeriness and human likeness are subjective. And they found that human likeness increased at a steady rate, but eeriness went up and then came down. So it looks like without using cherry-picked examples, they found an uncanny valley. But without using cherry-picked examples, did they find an uncanny valley? Two things. First, the uncanniness was supposed to be about how close the likeness was to us. Where eeriness is peaking here, it's pretty non-human looking. Is it uncanny valley or is it just a creepy looking thing? Secondly, we're still sort of cherry picking examples. Cake is tasty. Pizza is tasty. If we mixed them together, we wouldn't necessarily expect the result to be just as tasty because they were tasty for different specific reasons. Although maybe it's awesome, I don't know. So if these images were selected for their relatively higher acceptability, but they're acceptable for different specific reasons, it's fair to expect morphing them to produce something less acceptable. To test this, researchers used similar images, but made some tweaks. Without affecting the general level of likeness, they tried to reduce the creepiness of each image. And this experiment, subjects found that likeness increased at a steady rate, but there wasn't any sort of valley effect, suggesting likeness isn't a direct causal factor for our emotional reaction. Now we have sort of re-entered cherry-picking territory. This is not a pure morph anymore, but there are unaltered morphs where it doesn't seem to get creepy in the middle. So what do we have? We've got an axis label so broad, it's kind of like going, hmm. These houses are all different prices. I know what the most important factor is. It's the characteristics. And we've got cherry-picked examples with which we could demonstrate any phenomena, really. So it looks like all we have is a nonsensical model invented by inept roboticists trying to understand their failed attempts to build believable sex robots. But is all we have? A nonsensical model invented by inept roboticists trying to understand their failed attempts to build believable sex robots. Some researchers grabbed a random sample of robot images from the internet. A random sample to make sure they weren't cherry picking anything. Kind of like they were grabbing a random sample of baboons in the wild. Then they got people to rank these images. The results are messy, but it sort of looks like the robots that exist in the world, or at least on the internet, take a sort of valley pattern. So there is something going on that maybe roboticists have noticed. And they're okay. I mean, leave them alone. Assuming everything we just looked at is true, how can we explain what those researchers found? And what they found is what we want to understand. Because it was found in the real world? These ones are all made up, cherry-picked, and hypothetical. First, we need to understand what makes an abstracted likeness. How can we identify something like this? as having any human traits or emotions at all. I mean, this one is two dots and a line. This one is yellow and a sponge. As an example of what's going on, there's this beetle. People have found the males of this beetle swarming and trying to have sex with certain tossed away beer bottles. It seems, for arousal, their nervous systems ignore a lot of the details and just pay attention to a certain color dimples, and a shiny surface, which is sort of what the females look like. Also, the females are larger than the males, so something like a giant beer bottle could be like a common fetish. But the effect is so strong that the males will rub their little penises on the bottles until they die of dehydration. It's a real environmental issue. But we also do stuff like this. When we look at these, the same area of the brain lights up and at the same speed as when we see an actual human face. 
When we look for faces and emotions, we seem to ignore a lot of the details and just pay attention to certain shapes, angles, and compositions. But we can also tell that they're not real faces. We seem to have another system of our brain, maybe more detail or analytically oriented, telling us they're made up of other stuff. Do not rub your little penis on them. So when we aim to create a sex bottle, it's all about the shapes, angles, and compositions that communicate or induce certain emotions. But when we aim to create female beetle, it's still all about the shapes, angles, and compositions, but we also have the task of trying to make it believable to the detail-oriented part of our brain. We need to know where those emotional details are hidden in the structures of a human body. You know, what are the specific ways that mouth muscles have to move in order to communicate happy? Plus, if this is a regular, healthy human mouth. It's a more difficult task. And to get it done, it seems like a lot of people end up taking the approach of copying a human exactly. Trusting that accuracy alone contains those emotional details. But really, we're ignoring the emotional details. It's kind of like the first time you try to make a flying machine by just copying a bird. you're likely to miss the important physical forces at play and have unintended physical results. Trying to make an emotional machine by just copying a human and you get unintended emotional results. Fear of unknown or predatory intent, aversion to artificial expression, fear of unsanitized eyeballs, wanting to make something that can induce emotions in or communicate emotions to an audience is a very specific goal to have, like wanting to make a machine that can dribble a basketball. This is trying to build a machine that dribbles a basketball. This is copying the structures and movements of a human arm, hoping that it will end up being able to dribble a basketball. Even if the likeness-based project receives more funding, this one's probably going to work better. So over here, if you're just trusting that human anatomy alone can dribble a basketball or have an expected emotional response, the better you get the likeness of that anatomy, the better the machine is going to operate the way you want. These all may be different groups working from different faces, but it seems like they had the exact same goal and approach. Create something acceptable to humans by directly copying a human. So you get a decent sort of trend between human likeness and the emotional response. But the rest of these projects are all different approaches. I mean, here you've got people who look like they're just copying human likeness again, but without aiming for absolute accuracy. Like with these ones. Up here you've got, let's just make something cute. Two big circles. Hey everyone, the boss says we don't have to make the mouth move if the eyes light up with the audio. And then you've got things ranging from, I read big eyes are sympathetic, to, I read big eyes are sympathetic, to, we could only afford one eye. I don't know what I'm looking at here. You've got stoned Terminator. You've got, it's important for robots to be realistic, to elicit compassion in the user. And you've got, my perfect sex robot would be young, pale, and animated. Personally, I like this one. Or this one. I mean, there's some diversity here. But what I see is here, people trying to recreate human likeness. And here, people trying to have a positive emotional response in the audience, not caring so much about human likeness. And if you connect them with a line, it looks like the uncanny valley. But you would get a valley graphing machines that do anything a human can do. Human likeness, x-axis, something a human can do, y-axis. Projects based on recreating human likeness would probably look more like a human, and they would be reliant on human likeness for success. Let's assume a linear relationship. Projects just trying to accomplish the task would look less like a human, would have an easier time accomplishing the task, and would have less reliance on human likeness for success because they're not aiming for human likeness, hoping that human likeness alone solves the problem. They're trying to solve the problem. Let's assume some 
circle or square or blobby non-relationship thing. Connect them with a line and you've got the something a human can do valley. But it's not a gradient, it's just two broad approaches to recreating something a human can do. And then we connected them with a line. So why don't we see a bunch of graphs like this? The dribbling machine valley, or the automatic driving car valley. It's because most machines don't have a human likeness counterpart. Nobody's recreating a human and putting them in a driver's seat. And when we see something like a dribbling machine that looks nothing like a human, while maybe it can dribble a basketball kind of like a human, we would never look at it and think that this is like a human, that we should make a graph about human likeness. But when we see an emotional machine, even though it looks nothing like a human, it kind of looks like a human, because the task it's accomplishing isn't dribbling a basketball. It's triggering us in a part of our brain that goes, that's a human, that's an emotion. It's what this machine does, but we don't know why. We can't see those shapes, angles, and compositions that are really behind it all. It's a part of why for this task we will take the approach of copying a human exactly. What is it to be a human? Is it the skin? The eyes? The fear of death? We don't know, so we try to analyze them together on simple, common terms. We've created a graph about human likeness, and we've tapped into this bias. Broadly, roboticists are trying to make either robots that look cute and acceptable, or androids that look like a human. And we create the uncanny valley. We might go on to ask, what's in between? What happens when abstraction meets realism? Well, we already know human likeness doesn't cause an emotional response. And if we look at the images, it doesn't look like it's a gradient or a morph. Each robot has a certain level of success, aiming for a specific design. So in between, we're really just looking for different kinds of projects and how they relate to human likeness. Up here you might get more robots copying animation, making likable robots because they're copying established designs. Through here we might be getting those roboticists copying human likeness, just not entirely, with similar design problems to the more realistic robots, but also entering a level of human likeness where you don't know what they're doing. Where maybe they don't look as much like a creepy human because they've stopped resembling a human at all. And definitely some other stuff. But this bias is what I think is behind the uncanny valley. A pattern caused by common design approaches, rather than some cubic polynomial function of likeness based on our cognition. but I don't have a study to back that up. And I didn't do any math. So keep playing with ideas. Truth is everyone's goal, but it can be difficult to find. Find an idea that resonates with you. Did the ideas in this video resonate with you? Maybe they're wrong, or maybe they're only part of the story. There's always more to know. So keep playing.